he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his sand over the place and recover the leper. And his servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid me do some great things, wouldst thou have done it? How much more, rather, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean. So he went down and The subject I'm going to speak on today is don't put God in a box of preconceptions. Don't put God in a box. If we take a look at verse 11, we see that Naaman had preconceived ideas. He said in verse 11, the Naaman was rather went away and said, Behold, I thought. He had in his mind just what the prophet was going to do. He had preconceived ideas on what should be done and how God should do it. He said, you know, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God. No, it's not my God, his God. Because Naaman was a pagan. Oh, was a pagan worshipper. And strike his hand at the place and recover the leper. One of the things, friends, if we want God to move in this meeting and throughout these meetings, we are going to have to let God do it his way. Mm -hmm. Religious ideologies, preconceived ideas, or a hindrance to victory and blessings. Naaman came with his idea. He came with his preconceived ideas on what the prophet should do. Oftentimes, friends, we come into church with our plans, our programs, that we want God to move according to the program that we've set. And oftentimes, that program was not even prayed about. It was not, they did not hear from God. They set the program on what God should do and how God should do it. The problem is, friends, we say that we are the servants of God. But often we want to make God our servant and we want God to move our way according to our religion, according to our preconceived ideas, according to our culture. And if God moves any other way, let me tell you friends, you don't come into my house and tell me where to put my clothes. You don't tell me what drawers I am to put my socks in. You don't tell me where I am to leave my towels. If you do that, I will politely show you the front door. <laughs> it is my house. I do what I want. Friends, it's about time we realise this is God's house. And it's about time we realise that God do things his way. Yeah. Oh even if it goes against our culture, even if it goes against our religiosity, even if it goes against our preconceived ideas, this is the house of God. We often say, I'm led by the Spirit, but in reality, we want the Spirit to be led by us. We set the agenda, we set the programme on where the prayer should be made and it's good to have a programme but it's also good sometimes
to let the Holy Spirit tear up the program and let God move the way He wants to move how He wants to do it. Our programs can sometimes in the God. God, if you want to heal the sick, you've got to wait it because I've got it on my program. After the preacher, we're going to be praying for the sick. So don't you dare heal anybody until we get to that pro part of the program. God makes his own programs. And we will have revival in this country if we really let God do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it, and to whom he wants to do it. We have to get rid of our preconceived ideas. We, put, we also we put God in a box by limiting God to our human limitations. We think that just because I can't do it, God can't do it. Because you've reached a situation in your life which seems impossible, you limit God to your human limitations. Let me tell you friends, there is nothing impossible with my God. Amen. And when we realise that God is not you, that God is not limited without human limitations, then we will have victory, we will see deliverance, we will see miracles. If we see God as he is and stop trying to make God how we are. In Mark 10, 27, you can just write down the verses. Mark 10, 27. And Jesus, looking upon them, said, With man it is impossible. And I dare say there are people in this meeting today that are facing problems that are, humanly speaking, totally impossible. There is no way out. You tried the doctors. You tried the counsellors. You tried the psychologists. And there is no way out. I was speaking to a good friend of mine in the, in the ministry. He's called Pastor Abby. He runs a church in Dagenham. He's also a solicitor. And he said to me, Pastor McKinley, sometimes I've had people, he, he deals with immigration problems. And he said, sometimes, Pastor McKinley, I get people come to me and there is no way that they can be allowed to stay in the country. They've got no legal right to stay in the country. We have it, and it seems impossible. But somehow, through prayer, God has made a way. God has allowed them to stay in the country. It was beyond his expertise. It was beyond his understanding how that person was allowed to stay. But God can make a way where there is no way. He can make a highway in the wilderness. He can put a river in the desert. There is nothing impossible with my God. And in Luke 1, 37, says, With God, nothing shall be impossible. I thank God that my wife is here with me today. Five years ago, the doctors gave her 48 hours to live. She had respiratory problems, kidney failure. Everything went wrong. They gave her 48 hours to live. That in the, in, the, in the ideology and the expertise of the doctors, they were right. But I know a greater doctor. Amen. And I know a doctor that can do what no human doctor can do. And I won't go into the whole testimony. But you see, God made a way where there was no way. Amen. Before, several times in two months, they told me she wouldn't make it. But I tell you, friends, my God has the last word. And I want to tell you, friends, I don't know what you've been told about your situation. I don't know what your family have told you, your relations have told you. I don't care. I don't know what your denominations tell you. But my God has the last word in the situation. And when man can do no more, my God can do. My God is a healer. My God is a deliverer. My God is a miracle working God and he can make a way where there 
grace fell away. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The children of Israel came in out of Egypt and they saw the Red Sea. And they almost gave up. You know why? They limited God with their human limitations. There's no way. There's no way. We can't get through the Red Sea. We don't have time enough to get a boat. The Egyptians are coming after us. There is no way. We might as well give up. And they started to murmur. Let me tell you, friends, where there is faith, there is no murmuring. Hallelujah. And Moses stood stand, said, stand still and see. He didn't say see the Red Sea. He didn't say see the Egyptians. He said stand still and see the salvation of our God. There was no way that they could get through. But my God can make a way where there is no way. You may be a sea, but my God can open it. You may have come across a brick wall, but my God can knock down the walls of Jericho. He can make a way where there is no way. There's no way that Daniel could stop those starving lions from eating him. But my God could make a way. There's no way that... Um, there's no way the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Mish, and Abednego, could stop the fire from burning them. There's no way, but my God could. My God did. My God is a consuming fire. And the consuming fire consumed the fire that should have burned Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. The people that cast them in burnt, but my God was there in that situation. And the Bible tells us that when the three evil children came out, there was not even a smell of smoke on the Bible says. They didn't even smell of smoke. Not only does God bring you, bring you through, He brings you through smelling good as well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I've come here today to tell you that your situation is going to change. That God's going to reverse the situation in your life. I don't care what man has said about you, God is not finished yet. I tell you, friends, there may be people that are friends with you. There may be people that are friends with your life. There are some people that have, all, that have, have almost buried you. They have bitten your epitaph. They know what they're going to say. But I tell you, friends, the end. this isn't the end. This is the beginning. This is the meeting where things begin to change in your life. Where doors begin to open, where walls come down, where barriers are broken, where the, where the enemy has to flee. Amen. Someone said to me, Pastor McKibbin, the devil's been following me around. The devil's been chasing me. I said, well, the devil don't chase me because I chase him. <laughs> I've only got two things following me and the devil's not one of them. Then surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, some people try to curse the devil. I don't curse the devil. I don't curse the devil. I don't curse the devil. I tell you, I may have shared this. I think I may have shared it in the other church here. Well, I was in Nigeria at one time, and someone came up to me, and they got upset with my preaching. Well, they didn't get upset with my preaching, they asked for money, but it was Nigeria. They asked, they asked, they wanted me to give them money. And they said to me, I think that, they said to me, we're going to see the Babaloa. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had no idea who the Babaloa was. <laughs> I know about Olua. But I had no idea who Babalawa was. And she said to me, the Juju Witch Doctor. And I said, well, do me a favour, go and see a thousand. Go and see a thousand. 
I know this, the greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And you know what I did that night? I went to sleep. If it had been some Christian, it had been up all night. Oh, I bind you! I bind the devil! I bleed the blood of Jesus! I bind the strong man! No, I just went to sleep. I ain't got to worry about the devil, he's got to worry about me. I am a child and a king. I just went to sleep. Come on! Hallelujah! Come on! I said, if anyone puts a curse on me, I feel sorry for them. The Bible said, you will bless those that bless us and curse them that curse us. I tell you, I am blessed. And there ain't nobody could curse me. Amen. There ain't a spell that can curse me. Yeah. I'm a child of the living God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Someone said, what about generation cursing? Well, I ain't got no generation cursing. <laughs> I've been born again. I've been born again. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Oh, he's a pastor. your father and there ain't no curse on him. There ain't no curse on him. Turn to your neighbour, there ain't no curse on me. Hallelujah. I get fed up with Christians running about, oh, deliver me from this curse. Don't you realise it went when you were born again? And the only reason why the devil's got control over you is bad teaching and fear. Bad teaching and fear. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound heart. Praise the Lord. I didn't intend to say that. That's not in my notes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But as I said before, I'm not going to put God in a box. <laughs> and I don't allow my notes. You know, sometimes in theology, theologians put God in a box. And I'm not against Bible college, I believe in Bible college, I teach it, I teach it seminars, there's good Bible, a, a Bible college is no, is no better than the person teaching it. You get only go to teaching, you've got a good Bible college. You've got Bible denying theologians, you've got a, you've got a liberal Bible college. But I'm going to tell you, I believe that there are good seminars, but some theologians reject everything that goes against their preconceived ideas. That's why we've got people in that, that deny the virgin birth, deny the bodily resurrection, deny the miracles in the Bible, because they can't understand it. Well, I can understand it, but they can't. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. Neither can he understand them, for they are spiritually discerned. And oftentimes, when they come across a scripture that they can't explain, they allegorize it, they theorize it, they try to take it away from its obvious meaning. But I find in Scripture many times God does things that often go against many churches' idea of what God is. They go, God goes against many of the preconceptions of many Christians and we see that many times in the Bible. <coughs> Jeremiah, for instance. No, it's Isaiah, not Jeremiah, sorry. He told Isaiah to go around naked. And Isaiah was known as the naked prophet. We read that in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 2. And the same time spoke the Lord by Isaiah from Amos, Go and loose the sackcloth from off thy lines, and pull up thy shoes from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and bare foot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant have walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt. Now some people say, Well, God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't tell a man to do that. Oh, well, God did. You see, friends, we've got to stop putting God in a box. Now I'm not suggesting that any of the pastors here should walk around naked. That is what God told Isaiah to do. And then we read in Hosea, in, 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 in the Old Testament. 
God told Hosea to go and marry a prostitute, to take a wife who was a harlot as a judgment against Israel. We read that in Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord came unto Hosea, the son of Beeri, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. In the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go, and take unto me a wife of order, and the children of order, for the land hath committed great orders, departed from the Lord. Now that goes against many people's idea of what God is. It breaks away from many of the conceptions of God that God told this man to go and marry because God was going to use Hosea's life as a demonstration of backslidden Israel. And he told Hosea to go and name his children according to what God was going to do in the land of Israel. Study Hosea sometimes. His first son, that God told him to give the name, Jezreel. That means God will scatter. And God did scatter Israel. They were taken captive to Assyria. 120 years later, Judah was taken captive to Babylon. He scattered them. And then Hosea had a daughter. And God told Hosea to name his daughter Lomuama. And that means no mercy. No mercy. Because there came a time when God said, He had sent His promise to Israel. He had warned them over and over again. And now He was telling Israel, My mercy has run out. Now judgment is coming. No more mercy. I gave you time to repent. I warned you over and over again. No mercy. What a time when God can, when God can speak to you in your life and just say, I warned you. I've sent my pastors. You've heard my word. You've been warned over and over again. I gave you time to repent. But now, no more mercy. It's run out. It's run out. I know the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. But they can come to an end in some people's life when we go too far. And then he had another son. And he, God told him to call, Hosea, to call his son, Lo am I, which means, you are not my people. You are not my people. You no longer belong to me. It's amazing what God, you see friends, if you are prepared to throw away your preconceived ideas and do something, no matter how foolish it is, you can receive your miracle. You can receive your healing. You can receive your deliverance. God told Naaman to go and wash seven times it didn't make sense. You go to your doctor, and your doctor, you got your doctor of pain, and your doctor says, go and, back, go and wash in the river Thames seven times. That <laughs> doctor would, would now practice very long. <laughs> He'd be struck off. And I tell you, even as I, as a pastor, if I went to some churches and said, to, and said, look, I want you to go down to the pond and baptize and just seven times, I tell you, that would probably be the last time I'll be invited to preach in that church. <laughs> <laughs> but that's very good. And then we find out that Elijah tells a king to strike an arrow on the floor. <clears throat> it don't make sense. Can you... God, can we throw away our ideology and let God be God and let God do things His way? 2 Kings chapter 13 and Elijah at verse 15 and Elijah said unto him, Take the bow and arrows. And he took unto him the bow and arrows 
Now, uh, let me give you the background here. Elijah was about to die. Unlike Elijah, uh, unlike Elijah who didn't die and was caught up into heaven, Elijah was about to die. And the king comes to him. And Elijah gets up to the Shura Hanara. And the man of God, in his weak condition, on the bed lying down, he gets up and he holds the hand of the prophet. He holds the hand of the king, I should say. And the king fires that arrow. There's a lesson you can learn from that. Just because you are sick in your body, don't mean God can't use you in the medical ministry. Mm. Just because you're sick, doesn't mean God can't use you to heal the sick. I was preaching one day, I had an accident and my arm was caught in a forklift truck. Four days after I became a Christian. And somebody said to me, Pastor McKillop, how can you how can you heal the sick when you've got a bad arm? I said, the same way you do when you've got false teeth. <laughs> you can see my bad arm, but you can't see some of the people that are on medication for diabetes and other sickness in and other sickness in there. You can't see that. Let me tell you, friends. Even if you are perfectly whole, it doesn't mean you can heal the sick. I never claim to be a healer, but he is. My God is the healer. My God is a miracle worker. You can be on cut with diabetes and still pray for the sick and still let and see them recover. But you put God in a box and you think, oh, because I've got a bad arm, I can't pray for the sick. The moment I believe that, no sick person would be healed. Because I limit God according to what I am myself. I've seen miracles in my ministry over the years. I've seen outstanding miracles in the ministry over the years. But the moment I believe, let me tell you, friend, don't put, ever put God in a box. Don't ever put God in a box. The moment you put God in a box and you think, I can't do that job because I'm black. I can't get that job because I'm a female. I can't do that because of this. The moment that you do that, you put God in a box, you'll never get nowhere. But when you realise that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you, when you realise that nothing is impossible without God, when you for Him, I can run through a troop and leap over a wall, the psalmist said. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So he takes the arrow and he shoots it. And then he tells the prophet. It's like the prophet tells him to take the arrow and strike it on the ground. Hallelujah. It don't make sense. But the king get down and he, and he hit it on the ground three times. And the prophet was angry. He was angry. Why only three times? Now you're only going to get three victories. You should have struck it five or seven. I tell you, friend, God wants you to go more. God wants you to do more than you think you can do. God wants you to go that extra mile. He told him to strike it on the ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do me a favour, do something unusual, take your shoe off. I said we're going to do some strange things in a day. Take your shoe off. I don't know how many victories you want today. I don't know what your victory was. Maybe you, maybe you just got one miracle. Maybe you just got one deliverance. Maybe you want one victory. But I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you what I do. I'm going to get hold of my shoe and I'm going to go...
But there were those that were darts anyway. There were those that would jump anyway. There were those that would put all their in. I'll tell you, friend, if you come into the church and put all your up, put everything into the worship, put everything into the praise, yes. praise God as loud as you can and then praise Him loud. Amen. Jump as high as you can and then jump higher and you'll get the victory. Amen. You've got to break away from your traditions. I'll tell you, friends, before God could use me, I had to break away from my British traditions. I had to break away from my English traditions. I was saved in 1974 in the West Indian Pentecostal Church. Before that, I went to a Church of England church. It was traditional. And then I got invited to this Pentecostal church. I've never been in the Pentecostal church. When I went in there, I was like Naaman. I had preconceived ideas. I imagined it would be according to my Church of England culture. According to my English culture. That's what I imagined. I mean, I imagined it was all going to be quiet. I mean, you know some of these churches, the only time it comes to light when the benediction is said. <laughs> and that's what I expected. A Norse choir. And the minister would come out in his black robe and his white collar and say, We are going to read today from Psalm 23. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall be one. That's what I was expecting. I saw people jumping around, praising God, shouting hallelujah, and then I got so unusual. You know, in, in my... At that day, in England, men did not have men. And this man came and, wanted, and put his arms around him. I almost hit him. <laughs> we didn't do that. You don't go to those churches and someone put their arm around you. Women have always had women. You know in a dance hall you see women dance with women, you never saw a man, you never saw a man dance with a man in those days. I mean in those days in a nightclub women couldn't do anything about young women. I mean even if a woman goes to the toilet they have to go out and women to the toilet. And a nightclub. I don't know why, but there you are. But you see friends, I had to break away so that God could use me. Because God does not want me to be English. He doesn't want you to be Nigerian or Ghanaian. He wants us to be the children of the living God. He wants us to break away from our tradition because God is our Father. And wherever we come from, we pray to the same God. When I get that I was born in Bow. East London. But when I get down and pray, I don't pray my Father which art in bold. And you don't pray our Father which art in Lagos or Ohio State or Ibarden or Delta State or anywhere else. You don't pray those prayers. And if you're from Ghana, you don't pray our Father which art in Accra. That when we get down on our knees, no matter where we come from, no matter what part of the world, we get down and we say, Our Father, we charge in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we realise, friends, I don't care where you come from, it's where you're going that matters. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And as for me, I am seeking a city that had a foundation, whose builder and maker is God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. Friends, if we want victory in our life, if you're looking for a miracle, then let God do it his way. I believe in this meeting, barriers are going to come down. Chains are going to come off of people. People are going to be set free. At the end of this meeting, you will not come in the same way you come out. I was studying Ezekiel. I think it's Ezekiel chapter 9. I'm not sure. But they said when you go in for the east gate, you go out for the west gate. What does that mean? It means you don't go out the same way you came in. You come out different. I don't care what you come out with. 
Oh. I don't care what you came in with. God's got something good for you today. God's got something good for you today. This meeting, something is going to happen. Something is going to happen. Not because Pastor McKivitt's here. Not because of any of the other two preachers that are coming the other day. But because my Jesus is here. Because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is in this place. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbour and say, get ready for your miracle. I was actually preaching one time and I handed out some prayer cloths and somebody came to me and said to me, Pastor McKibbitt, we don't do that in our church. I said, well, I'm not in your church. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I didn't know it was that. I thought it was a 50 pound note. Praise the Lord. They said to me, well, our pastor wouldn't do that. I said, I bet your pastor wouldn't spit in somebody's life that Jesus did. I bet your pastor wouldn't tell a man to go and wash in a pool of Siloam that Jesus did. I bet your, I bet there's a lot of things. You say, but we need to get a, we need to get away from our ideas. If we are prepared to break with our traditions, I don't care what our traditions may be. Whether it's Baptist, Pentecostal, al -Adra, just break with our traditions and let God be God. I tell you, I have preached in many churches. I've preached in Pentecostal churches. I've preached in the celestial churches. I've preached in South and German churches. But I don't, put, I don't change my message. I preach the same way wherever I'm preaching. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I've been invited to, I've been invited by one of the celestial churches to preach in Akedi, I think they call this. Akedi, it's where the airport is in, in, in Nigeria, Akedi. Yeah, okay. Just test me. And um, I've been invited to preach there. I don't know how I'm going to go or not, I'm still praying about it. But you know, friend, I just preach the same way wherever we are. Let God be God and not our denomination and not our culture. It's time that we say, I don't care what the Pentecostal church teaches. I don't care what the Baptist church teaches. I don't care what my culture teaches. I am going God's way. I'm going to let God run my life. We're going to let God run the program and we're going to let God do it His way. And then something is going to happen. Then something is going to happen. Amen. Turn to your life and say something is going to happen. Something is going to happen. Going to happen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. 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 God does things. I'm, I'm, I'm cutting out a lot of my notes here. God often does things that are humanly speaking, illogical, and even contrary to our thinking. You know why? He said, my faults are not your faults. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. And then God, Jesus, or Paul said, that God does things that are often foolish. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things in the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things in the world to confound the things which are mighty. Over and over again in Scripture, we see God doing things that are unusual. I mean, God tells Moses to go and build an ark at a time when it had never rained on earth. The Bible says the waters from the deep used to come up and water in earth. It had never rained on earth. In the Bible, it says the waters from the water from beneath came up and watered the earth. It had never actually rained. And God told Noah, sorry, sir, what did I say? <laughs> Just test him. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to see your alert. God told Noah to go and build an ark on, on dry land. That's, that's humanly impossible. I mean, that doesn't make sense, does it? Can you just imagine Pastor McKinney going to, going to the desert? and building a ship. You know, I think the men with white coats would come and take me away. And I'll be putting them, I'll be putting them into the asylum. But you see, Noah 
move with God. And he was ridiculed, he was mocked, he was laughed at, but he built the ark on dry land. Now there's a lesson we can learn from that. You need to build up your life when everything is right. Noah did not wait until the flood came and hastily make a decision. When there was no rain, when there was no flood, when everything looked good, Noah built the ark. Don't wait until things go bad before you start praying. Don't wait until the flood comes before you start seeking God. Amen. Don't wait until sickness Amen. hits your body before you start praying. Amen. The time to get right is now, before the disaster, so that when the disaster comes, you are up ready. Amen. Your heart is ready. Amen. You're prayed up. I like, I like uh, Peter, and, Peter and John going into the temple to pray. They met the man at the gate. Now he would have said they were going to pray, but they were already prayed up on their way to pray. And when they met the man, they just said, silver and gold have I none, but just as I have a rise. He didn't say, well, wait, let me go in and pray first and get my God and make it all right. He, had, he was prayed up on his way to pray. Mm. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's take a look at some of the other things. God, there was no water in the wilderness. And what did God tell Moses to do to smite the rock? It don't make sense, it's illogical. If you are prepared to do the unusual, just because God told you to do it, something is going to happen. Something is going to happen. If you are prepared to do what God said, God told, no, God told Elijah to go to a widow woman and he would be fed. And when he gets there, she's got no food. It doesn't make sense. She's only going to make one meal and then die. It don't make sense. That God will make a way. You know, God, the, the, wine ran out in, the wine ran out of the wedding feast. And what did Jesus say? Took the water. I can just imagine Jesus, but why are oh, why? We run out of wine. Why are you saying put the water? I can say I can see Jesus saying, well look, I know you need wine, that's why I'm telling you to fill the water. Can you just imagine if you've got no wine for the communion service and I said, I said, okay, I'll go and get some and I come back with a glass of water. <laughs> you think I was crazy. Yes. But they, they obeyed the word of God. They obeyed the word of God. It don't make sense. It's totally illogical. You're filling containers with water when what you want is wine. It don't make sense. But they did it. When you just walk in obedience, you will get your miracle. You will get your deliverance. You will get your victory. And what about this? What about this? Oh, I like this one. They come for the tax. And Jesus, having got money to pay the tax, he tells Peter to go and take his fishing rod, go down and cast in a hook. Notice, he didn't even put bait on the hook. He just cast in his hook. Now, I used to be a fisherman. You don't catch fish that way, on a hook with no bait. And you don't go catching fish, hoping to find money. It don't make sense. But he cast it in, in obedience, and he got the money to pay. I tell you, friends, are you prepared to let God out of your box? Only when the woman broke the ambassador box was the perfume released. Was the goodness in that box released? Sometimes I say, God, I don't any preconceived ideas I've got of you break them. Whether it's theologic, theological, whatever, denominational, cultural, break it, and let God do things His way. I don't care where it is. The sick, they brought the sick people out. So the shadow of Peter passed in Bowen Hill then. Yes. It's illogical. I want to get in the shadow of Peter. 
I don't understand that that's going to heal you. I don't need to understand it. I just need to get in the shadow. I just need to get in the shadow. I don't understand how the river Jordan is going to heal my leprosy, but I'm just going to get in. I'm going to go in there anyway, because the prophet told me to get in there. I don't understand how hitting an arrow on the floor is going to give me victory, but I, the prophet said it, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. How many of you say to me, Pastor McKerry, I need my miracles. I need my deliverance. I need, I need my victory. And I want you to do some strange things today. I want you to get on your feet and jump like you've never jumped before. I want you to dance like you've never danced before. I want you to shout louder.
hope you enjoyed this video brought to you by Full Gospel Evangelism. If you want to know more about David McKivitt and the work of the Full Gospel Evangelism, please write to Pastor David McKivitt, Full Gospel Evangelism, care of Emmanuel House of Worship, 89 Valentine Road, London, E17 3JJ, England. Telephone us on 0203 289 1747. If you are outside the United Kingdom, it is 0044 3289 1747. You can text your prayer request to us on 0377 869 0931. I'll take the number again 0777 869 0931. If you are outside the United Kingdom, it is 00 44 777 869 0931. If you would like to email us on fge123 at ntlworld.com or visit our website www.fge.org.uk. <laughs>